Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I want to welcome to the show an old friend, somebody you haven't seen in a while, and I'm so excited that she's here, Brett Rossi. I'll clap because, you know, there's nobody else in here. How are you? Everybody at home who's listening is clapping. Okay, good. I'm I'm great. Um, I'm here. You are here. We've been planning this forever. I know. We've been trying, at least. Yes, we have, but we're both pretty busy. But I'm actually going to see you next week, too. Did you know that? Wait, because we're shooting? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's like on a Friday or something, Yeah, we're shooting for Naughty America. Yeah, when I saw that, I was like... And you asked who I wanted to work with. I yep. was like, oh, this is a great day. I get a pick. I know. I get a pick my penis. I'm big on that. Like I always, especially when I'm shooting for myself, my own side, I always ask the girls who they want to work with. Because I want to put you with somebody that you like. Yeah. I want you guys to have good chemistry. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and Naughty America is pretty liberal about like letting me pick kind of who I want. I have to run everybody past them, right. but they, they give me a lot of creative freedom, which I really like. That's nice. I don't get that a lot these days, so yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the other side. I know. I actually got to write my own scripts. Uh, I got Final Draft. It was Ooh. very exciting. That's fancy. And, uh, and I wrote my own scripts for the last two scenes that I shot for them. And <laughs> it was really funny because, so like a lot of times, I'm sure that you... Were they you, poignant? Like, were they like... You're going to win an award for this scene. Yeah, well, I kept saying that, but I always say that because I'm full of shit. But no, they weren't. They, they were funny, I thought. I was trying to make them humorous. Yeah. And, um, but it was funny because, you know, a lot of times when I'm shooting scripts, like everyone on set's always like, oh my God, this is so stupid. Who wrote this shit? You know, like everyone like always me. says that. Yeah, we always do. <laughs> Everybody does, the performers. So I warned everyone before we got to set. I'm like, okay, everyone. I wrote these scripts so you can't make fun of them. Nobody gets to go, who wrote this script? That's just stupid. I fucking wrote it. So everyone, you all have to love the script and talk about how great it is. I I just feel like whoever's writing the scripts, I really think they still live in their mom's basement. A lot of them, um, some of them. A lot um, of them do. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but I get the feeling that many of them do. Um, to have never been on a production set before. And it's difficult when you have somebody all the way many, many thousands of miles away writing in a, a script different country. in a different country, writing a script for you just basically because they don't understand the logistics of the location that you're shooting at. Or which even like the production and, and, in and general. how how it yeah. works. Which isn't necessarily their fault, but like I find when I'm writing my own script and I know where I'm shooting, like I know the angles I can get. I know what's feasible Mm -hmm. there so I can write the script around what I've got available to me. It just makes it like so much fucking easier. Yeah. Which is really... Instead of like, okay, we're going to start the scene with your hair wet, then it's going to be dry, then it's going to be wet again, and then it's going to be dry again. Yeah, well, I had to do the... (laughs) I had to shoot the most ridiculous scene uh, for Twisties um, a couple of weeks ago. Twisties, which by the way, I was one of the very first contract girls. You Just were. Just to throw that out you there were. with Emily Addison and yes. Taylor Vixen. Yep. My contract sisters were the OG Twisties yep. contract girls. And Taylor Vixen, was, that was when Taylor Vixen was my roommate. Oh really? Yeah, she, she was your was, roommate? She was my roommate. That girl was the loudest walker I've ever met in my life. I walk pretty loud. No, 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 no. Like she would come home. Like it was funny. Okay. So she's got like size five feet and she's like this little girl. Yeah. She would out because she'd like to, she would like to party. So she'd be out, and then she'd come, and I go to bed. Really, fucking, all three of us like to party. Well, you guys are young, beautiful women. Of we course, you do. We were crazy together. And I'm like an old fart, and I go to bed early. And, and this is when I was married, and so uh, my husband and I would be sleeping, and she would come home at like two in the morning, and I swear to God, it sounded like she was purposely stomping like stomping up the stairs stomping to her room and I was like this girl is tiny like how is she so loud and even I we even had a guest stay over who said the same thing she's like does your roommate purposely walk really really loudly and I have all wood floors um, I had no idea she was your roommate then yeah because I always picked you to do the shooting mm-hmm. yeah they'd be like who do you want Tammy or Holly and I'm like Sorry, I'm kind of partial to Holly. Oh, shucks. Nothing against Tammy. It's just you 
Well, we've known each other yeah. for a while. I wrote you a long, long you love did. letter. <laughs> you did. So when Brett and I first sort of met, she sent me this email and she sent me, I wish I still had it. And she said, I probably do photos of herself. And she basically, <laughs> the crux of it was, Hey, I really want to do this. I think I have the potential. I just need somebody to give me a chance. And there was something in your email that reminded me of myself. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, like I could see the ambition. I could see that you were serious about what you were saying. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why don't you come over um, to the ranch? We'll shoot like one set. And, you know, I'll send it and around. And you were shooting Madison Ivy I was shooting that Madison day. Ivy that day. When she was blonde. Yeah, when she was still per- fairly new. Mm-hmm. And um, I shot a half day on Madison, and then I shot one set on you. And then I sent it to around to a couple of magazines, and like everybody bought it. Yeah. That was like one of my most successful selling sets that I've ever shot. That, that, right after that was then when I became Miss Howard Stern, and then um, a, a Playboy Cyber Girl, and mm-hmm. then a Penthouse Pet, and then everything just kind of spiraled after that. Yeah. And now here you now are. Now here I am. Big, I'm jaded. I'm <laughs> jaded. Superstar. That's like, I want to go to bed at eight, and I want to be off set by three. I'm, girl. I totally get it. Like these people who pull these all. Like I hate night shoots. I. Hate oh my god! Them. I hate night shoots too. It's like in my like. What do they call those? Like, Contract? Like, you know when, when uh, you're like this big headliner of, and they have like their things that they want. Like, I want green m and Oh, like stipulation? Yeah. It's like a <laughs> stipulation of mine. I'm like, I don't do night shoots. Yeah. Unless it's like, if it's like a feature, mm-hmm. then I understand. Yeah. But if it's just a fucking scene, no one cares. Just mm-hmm. make it look like it's dark, please. Yeah. Because I go to bed. At, I'm in my jammies by like 8. Yeah. I'm in bed sleeping by 9. Yeah. I tr- I went to bed yesterday at 8.45. Yeah. But, well, I tried to go to bed at 8.45. But then I got woken up in the middle of the night. Uh, my brother's dog, we're, he's out of town, so we're taking care of his dog. And we put him in my bedroom because he fucking barks at everything. And we <laughs> woke up in the middle of the night and he had shit all over the fucking bedroom. Like diarrhea oh shit. The and, fucking you, and the smell, smell woke you up, didn't woke it? Woke me oh up. Oh my God, that's the worst when that happens. Was, so my boyfriend and I had to like carry the bed outside. And it's just everywhere. And dog and poop. tracked it on like the carpet. And we had to like clean the carpet. And, uh, uh, it was like three in the morning. I was, was just so having mad. this conversation the other day. I, would, I literally have no problem using my bare hands to pick up horse shit. Yeah. But dog poop totally different. is a whole different ball game. I like the smell of horse shit because I it love actually it. reminds me of my childhood because I mm-hmm. rode horses. They, well, I mean, their diet is completely different. It's just so. grass. Yeah. And like some mush pellets. Yeah. Like, I mean... It's probably like, what, do you think like Nicole Aniston's poop smells really good because she's vegan? Probably. I mean, I'm vegetarian and my shit stinks. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. I mean, I guess I'm just like rotten inside. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, because I still eat dairy and I'm lactose intolerant. So uh, I do. Yeah, it's kind of same. I think like we're all lactose intolerant, but like it's really hard to give up. Cheese but I mean, so like my shit sometimes I'm like, did something crawl up there and die? <laughs> like, I don't understand it. It's not sexy to talk about, but I don't really even care, man. Me and my boyfriend, like, still don't acknowledge that the other one, like, poops. We have separate really? bathrooms. I yeah. poop with the door open and, like, talk to people. I've been like that since I was a kid. I talk to people with the door open. I poop with the door open. I don't even care. Like, contractors are here um, or <laughs> at my house right now because we're getting our master bathroom remodeled. I just shit with the door wide open. I don't even care. They, like, walk by. They're like, hey. I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't even care. So like funny. I get claustrophobic in the bathroom, <laughs> and I get lonely. Like I want to talk to people. You get lonely. <laughs> like the phone isn't enough. I get lonely. <laughs> you don't get lonely. I'm like, hello. No, I don't. I don't get lonely. It's like the only time I have to myself. I sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I get lonely. So I don't know how to how to segue from the poop talk to this, but uh, I do want to talk that you were just crowned a vixen angel. Yeah, I was, which is was very exciting. It was exciting, and um, the story is very similar okay. to you. I thought uh, you were going to say to the shit. I don't know why. <laughs> to the, the I mean, head is still on the shit story. Shit. <laughs> um, so. Uh, 
I've known Greg. Greg shot like my first real scene. Mm-hmm. Um, my first like girl girl scene mm-hmm. for reality. And, yeah, for reality okay. kings with Sammy Rhodes and Kirsten Price. And I, mm-hmm. I remember I was like so nervous, mm-hmm. and um, they just like ravaged me, and it was a lot of fun. But I was like so intimidated by Greg, right? And because um, Greg and I are very similar in the fact that we're both like perfectionists. Mm-hmm. Um, I have OCD and I'm a little off the wall, so I don't mm-hmm. really know like what he is, but mm-hmm. maybe he is. I'd like to think maybe he is, but the point is, uh, a few, I'd say months ago, I was in Vegas and I was working the exotic dancer convention mm-hmm. and I was like, you know what? They had named like the new Vixen Angel or whatever. And I was like, how come I'm not a Vixen Angel? Mm-hmm. What the fuck? You've been pretty much everything else. That, I was like, why am I not a Vixen Angel? I was feeling a little like down yeah. and out. And like, I've given him my first IR, my first anal. And mm-hmm. like, you know, he's pretty much shot all my firsts. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote him this long text message. I didn't I didn't have his email or else I would have written him an email. Mm-hmm. And I even said that in the text. I was like, hey, by the way, sorry, I don't have your email. Mm-hmm. I wrote him this long thing and I said, this is why I think you should make me a Vixen Angel. Mm-hmm. And he was so excited that I wrote to him and he told everyone like his whole company when I got named when I when we did like the actual ceremony mm-hmm. everyone came up to me and they're like your your letter to him was so touching mm-hmm. and blah 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 and I'm like oh that that was kind of oh everyone saw this okay so we're going to just <laughs> tell everyone that I asked all right well yes I asked so um yeah I just I just felt like you know what if I I've always been that way. If mm-hmm. I want something, I'm going to just go for it and yeah. ask. I mean, what's the worst they can say? No. Yeah. I've true. been told no a million times, mm-hmm. and it's, like, really embarrassing. But, uh, you know, I, and I was really excited. He said yes, and um, it was it was really cool because I feel like his brand— I know a lot of people have, like, their own personal opinions of him and his brand, whatever. I don't really? really yeah, really? I didn't catch on to really? that. Really? <laughs> but you know what? I don't really care. Um, I care about my brand. Yeah. And so I feel like his brand, it, since I was a contract girl basically my whole career, mm-hmm. now I'm not, and I haven't mm-hmm. been for a while, I feel like his brand kind of is parallel with my brand mm-hmm. and and they're very much alike in the classiness and mm-hmm. you know the glamour and mm-hmm. and that's kind of where I've been struggling with my career is the fact that I'm stuck in this like contract glamour girl talk, world that yeah. doesn't exist. I remember we talked about that because mm-hmm. it's so hard it's so expensive to shoot the kind of stuff that we want to shoot and uh Greg's like one of the few people that has the money to do know, it. Right? And he's incredibly talented. I mean, right. there's no denying this stuff's beautiful. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish that like he would let me do some big hair and, you know, some smoky eye. <laughs> but but besides that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everything when you're on set with him, it feels like the old days and mm-hmm. I feel almost at home. Yeah. So I that's why I wanted to become a Vixen Angel because mm-hmm. I wanted to be a part of something cuz I, I lately you're I've not, been Yeah, cuz you're not going to get that kind of treatment in no, any other no. places. No, 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 no. And lately I've been really struggling with yeah. with the fact that I've come to a point in my career where it's I I have enough confidence to say it's it's kind of um kind of plateaued Mm -hmm. and that's not bad but it took me a long time to understand that it wasn't bad Mm -hmm. because I'm one of those people where if I'm not doing something then I feel like I'm failing Mm -hmm. and also our culture kind of pushes and breeds that in social media and you see like everybody's doing a million things Mm -hmm. you feel like that's how I feel I go on social media and I compare myself to everybody well and I I struggle with um I'm actually bipolar so I struggle with my own personal issues. So mm-hmm. when I see social media, it's like a constant, I have to look like this. I have to feel like this. I have to be this person. I have mm-hmm. to be this image and, and, you know, I have to compete. So it's really hard to not get wrapped up in that. Mm-hmm. 
And, um, you know, I can preach it all day long, but I do. I get wrapped up in it sometimes because I, I feel like I wish I was vain enough to sit there like we were talking about earlier and mm-hmm. taking pictures of myself constantly and living on my social media. Mm-hmm. I went through some things in the past with with tabloids and really invading my privacy mm-hmm. to the fact to the point where a lot of girls have the ability to go and be Jane Doe. Mm-hmm. You know, they're this person, this is their porn persona and their mm-hmm. image. And then when they go home, they're Jane Doe. Nobody knows who they are. Right. Whereas Brett Rossi and Scott Teen Ross are the same people. Yeah. Because of my past you know, decisions and tabloids and just that whole lifestyle that I lived, which, you know, I'm not regretting it or or bashing it, but there are repercussions that a lot of girls, they they strive to be famous or well-known or, you know, they want to be their their name and lights, Mm -hmm. but they don't understand that the repercussions of that is you will always be a porn star. It doesn't matter what you do, and it sucks. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. I mean, I've done comedy, I've done TV shows, I've done this, I've done that, but no matter what, at the end of the day, I'm always the porn star. Yep. So I struggled a lot in the last few years with not having that ability to like shut it off and and have my private life. So because of that, I've become super recluse and super private. Right. Which is like totally opposite of the person I used to be. Right. Yeah, because you've seen like the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people, everybody wants to be famous, but they don't, you know, understand what it takes to get there and what the other side of that of that yeah. fame is. And they and it it really um it's really hard when you do have a mental, you know, disorder um because you're constantly told you're somebody when you're not that mm-hmm. person that if that makes sense, yeah. you're constantly reading about who the person uh that they've created. So the tabloids I in my experience mm-hmm. um I feel like they create this person that they they think you are, this persona. You have no choice over it. Either mm-hmm. they like you or they don't. Right. And if you're in porn, they're not going to like you no matter what. It doesn't right. matter if, you know, you rescued a sinking ship with a bunch of children on it. Like, they're, no matter what you're You'll still say, porn star rescues right, sinking right, ship exactly. with children. And, um, and it takes a lot to really step back and, and get your mind in order mm-hmm. or else it eats you alive. Yeah. I mean, you guys, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, with being, I mean, a porn star and especially with the internet, you mm-hmm. know, once you put yourself out there, there's no taking that back. No. And then the world just sees you through one lens. Which totally sucks because, um, I mean, I know so many girls who are multidimensional mm-hmm. and uh, multifaceted, um, like, With me, I do voiceover work, I do comedy, I do acting, I, you know, do this and this and this and that, and um, no matter what, I'm just Brett Rossi, the porn star. Yeah. And you have to really become comfortable with that. I don't even know how we got on this topic, but... I don't... Yeah, we went on a tangent. We just went on a tangent, but it's a great tangent. This is a great tangent, and that's honestly, like, part of the reason that I wanted to start this podcast was to give people like you a voice and and so that the listeners could hear that you're like a human being with hopes and dreams and right. you're not just a porn star and you have you know a separate life and a separate persona and and the feedback actually I've gotten from a lot of my listeners has been really great that people really like that they're discovering who these people are as people and it's cha- right. I've had quite a few people tell me that it's completely changed their opinion on the industry and, um, you know, on certain girls and all that. So it's been, it's been great. I mean, cause I know you guys as, as that, you know, you us know? personally. So, right. you know, like for some reason with me, I don't know what it is, but people get it so twisted in regards to who I am. When mm-hmm. people meet me, it's so funny. They'll, the first thing they say to me is, Oh my gosh, I thought you were going to be like this cracked out, drugged out mess. And I'm like, what possibly, 
I don't understand what behaviors I've ever done to make you yeah. think that. I've never been, um, I've, I've never publicly done anything that was so irrational that it made somebody think that I possibly had a drug problem or I was cracked out and crazy. And so they meet me and they realize, oh, wow, you're actually like a really down-to-earth, normal yeah. person. Right. I mean, I like to play with my ponies and decorate my house. <laughs> Like, I'm a very boring person. So whenever I do interviews, they're like, so, what do you do for fun? And I'm like, I am the most boring person ever, and I love it. Yeah, I know. I I feel the same way. I'm the same. Like, I'm so happy if I can spend a weekend, like, cleaning the house and, like, mm-hmm. catching up on work. Yeah. That's, like, to me, like, that's, like, relaxing to me because I'm just so task-oriented. Yeah. Anything where... I can disconnect from reality right. is the most comforting and the place that I find the most solace from because, I mean, a great example, my husband and I went looking at houses a few months ago and it was so awkward because somebody came up to me and they said, oh my God, you're Brent Rossi and they're with their family and we're looking at houses and I'm clearly with a man yeah. You don't know who this man is. Right. Like, and you're this weird stranger coming up to me and saying this. And, um, you know, it would be different if I was like this actress on a bunch of movies, mm-hmm. like television shows or whatnot, but we all know why you're a fan of right. me. Right. So it, there's, there's borders and, and, you know, it's a little bit different when people come up to us porn stars and say, Oh, it's so great to meet you. Like when you're on an airplane, someone yells your name. It's very uncomfortable because then people are like, oh, well, who's that? Wait, Brett Rossi, who's that? And then they Google, and then it's like a whole awkward plane ride or walk back to the car. Do you ever get like car. someone sitting next to you who's like— Yes, I have. And I've also gotten, you know, the can we have a picture? And I mean, I'm sorry, but if I'm traveling and my hair's in a bun and I've had a terrible flight day, I say no sometimes, you yeah. know? I say that's a sorry. Yeah. I have no problem signing something, but I just— there's a line, mm-hmm. and um, some people are much more open and cool about it, but I've had my privacy invaded so much that, mm-hmm. you know, I've become that kind of recluse, super antisocial person. I'm like the weirdest person. I'm super friendly, super talkative, but I'm actually very shy, mm. which is totally opposite of who I was, say, even five years ago. Right, right, right. So... Uh, well, I always remember you as the girl who uh, came to my birthday and actually brought me a cake when uh, when my family <laughs> forgot to bring me a used, birthday cake. We used the the long candle. Yes, the, like what what are those like stem? It's like a stem candle. Um, no, they're oh, fuck. Why am I spacing on what they're called? Yeah, the long tall candles. The long tall candles and. Nobody had birthday, and your mom like asks me like like I was the one in charge of yeah. bringing everything. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, "Wait, we're supposed Wait, to have the candles." Yeah, and I was like, "It's my birthday. I'm supposed to have. Of course, I'm supposed to have a cake. What the fuck? Yeah, that what's wrong amazing. with you people? That was amazing. And then like the slices, I was like, okay, well, this is this was meant just for Holly, so <laughs> we're gonna have to like you know. I feel like we bonded over our love of sugar. Because you also love donuts. Oh, my gosh. I'm obsessed with donuts. I'm so obsessed with donuts that everywhere I go, I have to try, like, a different donut shop. Um, How are you so skinny if you like donuts so much? Because I work out like a crazy person, and I'm actually a very healthy eater. Um, I started having stomach problems a few years ago, and I got this— I. I literally started, like, I had really bad stomach problems. I always felt sick. I was getting really bad eczema on my face and on my body every time I would eat meat. And so I went to this allergy specialist, and I took this test, and he basically told me everything I was allergic to, and I found out I was allergic to meat. Mm. So I cut out meat, and I cut out everything I was allergic to. And so, I mean— What would you have done if donuts were on that list? Well, technically, (laughs) gluten is part of, um, you know, Uh one of my sensitivities. So there's like a Richter scale of like how allergic you are to things. And, you know, 
I'm a fan of playing Russian roulette with my life. (laughs) That's not a secret. I mean, come on. I've made some pretty interesting decisions in my life. I still do it. Like uh, a great example, I'm allergic to lobster and... (laughs) I was at Sapphires in New York. Are you allergic to shellfish or just lobster? Just lobster. It's weird. I can have crab, but I can't have lobster. Mm. I can have shrimp, but I can't have prawns. I thought they were the same thing. No. I don't know. There's something about them that's different. I don't know. It's so weird. Like, Mm. I thought crab and lobster were, like... Pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm at Sapphires in New York, and I'm really hungry, and they're, they bring out, like, all this food, and they're like, oh, this is our lobster mac and cheese. Well, knowing damn well, I'm allergic to lobster, like, bad allergic. I was like, I'll just take a little sample. So I took a sample. Next thing I know, I've got hives all over me. Oh, my God. I have to go on stage, oh and I look like I have chicken pox. It's just all over the place, and so... How did that go? It sucked. I have no self control <laughs> sometimes over things. So, I mean, I pretty much just accepted that about me. I think, you know, I think as we grow older, we start to like, I think one of the greatest things is accepting your shortcomings. Right. Like, I've accepted the fact that I just will not work, push myself working out on my own. I have to take a class, mm-hmm. I have to have a trainer, I have to have someone yelling at me because I just will come up with a thousand excuses not to. Not to finish. Like this morning I went and worked out and I took a class and halfway through I was like thinking of excuses to leave. <laughs> I mean, I do it all the time. See, I won't leave in the middle of a class, but yeah. I usually won't, but I'll start, my head start telling mm-hmm. me to do it. Uh, you, you should get home early and shower. You got a lot of stuff to do before this podcast. You know, you're, you just started your period. You're not feeling that great. Like, <laughs> oh my God. But then I'm glad I pushed myself through. Right. But, Fuck, dude. I hate exercise. I fucking hate it. You know, I hate, I hate it. it. I hate it, but, but I, I, I have to do it. I have to do it yeah. because my mind is like constantly so go, 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 go. Yeah. I literally, if somebody could open up my brain, they would be like, what is wrong with this lady? I think <laughs> about so many things that don't even like doesn't even matter like i'm already stressed out about christmas shopping oh my god i am too because i like to get it done i'm I'm like oh my god oh my god and then i gotta get this this christmas present but if i buy it right now then i might lose it but then i could hide it where i could find it like i literally (laughs) am one of those people where i overthink everything yeah i've totally like bought people christmas presents and then put it away and then forgot i bought it and then bought them something else close to christmas well get this last year i was gonna make Kaden cross Mm -hmm. um, a blanket for Christmas because she's one of my best friends. Yeah. And I was cleaning out my closet. So I totally forgot about that present. I was like, eh, fuck that. I was cleaning out my um, closet, like my storage closet a few weeks ago, and I found all the stuff to make the blanket. And I was like, oh, here's the blanket. I never gave her. And then I ended up just like using it for something else. I made like, I made like a ferret blanket. I like sewed like a ferret. (laughs) I have like a farm. I do. I've got a ferret named Frank, uh-huh. a rabbit named Colin. Don't ferrets stink? No. Oh. So they're kind of like they're they're related. They're they're not rodents. Mm-hmm. Um, they're related to the feline species. So they're like cats. If you don't clean out their cages, or okay. or I just knew someone who had ferrets and they smelled. So. Yeah. If you don't, it, they definitely have a skunky scent to them. If you don't wash them, mm-hmm. um, the main thing is their bedding, uh, their blankets, and then. He's litter trained, Mm -hmm. Frank, so, like, you just clean out his litter box and Mm -hmm. call it a day. But uh, I have a a rabbit named Colin. He comes when he's called. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. He's so amazing. Um, And then I have three dogs, two horses. Do you have the same dogs that you had before? Yeah, Charles, Samson, and Tiny. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember Tiny because it's so tiny. Mm -hmm. And then, like, one of them is a lab, right? Yeah, And then the other one's, like, a Pomeranian. Yeah, Charles. Charles is a dick. Yes, he Charles pretty much pee, he pee, he got kicked out of like doggy day camp because he pisses on everyone. <laughs> so I had to like you know how some people like pill shop or like doctor yeah. shop for pills. I had to like boot camp shop or like for my dog because he kept getting kicked out of like all the camps for uh-huh. peeing on other dogs. So I finally found one, and you know I just told him straight up, I'm like, look, my dog's super cool, but he's gonna pee on everyone. Yeah, and they're like. Oh, okay. He's not like aggressive. I'm like, no, he, he just wants to pee. He's just a dick, you know? So, so yeah. 
And he uh, barks at everything and everyone. And it's so funny because I live in this gated community, and uh, they're, like, super strict, like, you know, with security, like, oh, your dog's barking. So they'll call, and I'm like— not even home. I'm like in a different state. Oh, my dog's not even home when my dog's really like in the backyard barking. Mm -hmm. I just lie and say my dog's not home because I kept getting tickets. I kept getting fines. Jesus. Yeah. I didn't know that they did that for dogs. Yeah. I mean, my neighborhood is kind of bougie and yeah. so I don't know, but I'm going to fucking find the neighbor that's tattling on me. Yeah. They're probably just jealous because my house is like the best house for Halloween and Christmas. <laughs> Dude, so there's this, like, pumpkin lady. She's called the pumpkin lady, and she lives, like, three houses down. She's, okay. like, on the corner house. And every year she has, like, 1,500-plus pumpkins. 1,500. I swear to you. I could show you photos. Okay. And she, like, puts them up on, like, these little, like, stage things, and, like, everyone comes and gathers around and whatever. So when I first moved into this neighborhood, I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> I was like, this lady is not going to beat me in the decoration category. <laughs> so I tell my husband, I'm like, look, you're not in the holidays, but get the fuck over it because I am. <laughs> so we go and we, like, make this, like, haunted graveyard and we go all out and uh -huh. kids are, like, lined up up to like get candy from us and take pictures from us so now it's become like a tradition every year like yeah. we're the house that like does all out well last year every year we do like a theme and mm -hmm. last year the neighbors across the street copied us <gasps> they never decorate ever oh and last year they copied us Christ. And I was so fucking mad. Like I'm getting mad just thinking about it. <laughs> and I was like, I was up. like, I was like, fuck this. We're never decorating before because we want it to be a surprise. So this year, right. our theme is um, we're doing a haunted like cornfield. Okay. So I bought all these corn stalks and we're gonna like put them in our front yard and like. So you haven't done it yet. No. So we wait until the 29th. <laughs> but then you don't have. And then we start time. production. <laughs> And it is a production. But you don't have that much, that much time to enjoy it. So though. I put up don't I put up decide? basic decorations. Oh, okay. I put up basic decorations. So it's like layered. Yes. <laughs> and then I put like the deep decorations. And then I go over to the pumpkin lady's house afterwards and I tell her how amazing my house is and like her pumpkins are just like basic. First of all, I have a competition with this pumpkin lady and she's like 80. <laughs> and I'm like fuck this pumpkin bitch. Like, you know, I get, like, really aggressive about it. My husband's like, dude, you need to, like, calm down. She's, like, 80. I'm like, who cares about her stupid pumpkins? They're not even real. They're, like, the plastic ones that she uses, like a Dremel. Oh, that's cheating. That's that's a cop-out. Yeah, yeah. But she's got, like, she has a storage unit, and she brings them out. And, like, it's kind of cute. They all have, like, their little stories in the year that she carved them. And every year she comes out with five Wait a new How'd ones. How do you carve them if they're if they're fake? So that's what's kind of unique about it. She uses like a Dremel, and then she puts like lights in them, like they were almost like they're real pumpkins. And you would only know that they're plastic Wait. until you touch them. So she carves plastic pumpkins. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Don't know. <laughs> no idea. So I mean, I kind of like hate this lady, but I kind of love her at the same time. You need to like find out her secrets. I know, but my house is like the house for the holidays because I find w holidays are just like my thing. Mm -hmm. I just really like to get lost in. I love to give to others. I love to spoil people, mm -hmm. and. I feel like when you decorate your house all cute, like, it really makes people drive. Like, think about when you drive by a house and you see a house decorated yeah. cute. You're like, oh, my God, how cool. No, that's how I feel about I don't decorate my house for Halloween because I'm not really into Halloween. Though, honestly, like, if I had the time and if I had, like, the, the finances, like, I would. But I do love Christmas, right? So every year I usually get my, my house professionally lit up with see, like, I'm professional gonna do that lights. See, I'm going to do that I can't do it myself. Actually, and <laughs> my boyfriend did it one year because he was like, we're not going to spend the money. I'm going to do it myself. He did the worst job. There was like wires hanging yeah. everywhere. And I was like, Last this is year, so Last year, our power sloppy. kept blowing. Really? Yes, because we had too many plugged in. <laughs> like, I was like, this is not – I want to do the professional for sure. Yeah, the professional makes a huge difference because, yeah, he did it I think last year. And I was like, this looks like – 
Dude, shit. I'm like and we got crazy. like our first fight about the Christmas lights. I was like, this looks terrible. He's like, no, it's fine. Like, you're like, this is a representation of my house. I know. And and the thing is, it's like what you're saying. So, you know, I work long, as you know, in production, mm-hmm. we work long days. And especially at winter, you know, a lot of times you're coming home from set and it's dark already. Yeah. I leave when it's dark and I come home when it's dark. And it makes me happy to pull up to my house and see it like lit up right. with lights. Like that like just makes me feel... Like, warm inside. And I love Christmas. Like, I'm very close to my family, and we've always, you know, made a big deal about Christmas. And it's just, like, for me, it's just, it's a it kind of harkens back to my childhood, and it yeah. just makes me feel safe and happy. And so I love, love Christmas. And um, I, like, I, go all out. I decorate my stables. Really? I like, yeah, I just moved to this new barn, and I'm literally already thinking about, I've got a bitch in space. Uh-huh. So I've got, like, the end you the end stalls and um I purchased like or I I'm leasing like four stalls so mm-hmm. I made them like giant stalls because mm-hmm. I have two giant horses right and then um the owner built us like this deck mm-hmm. so we have like this huge deck and I finally have my dream of like we just put up like a little bistro set so we can like sit on our chairs and like sip coffee or Aww. I don't I don't know why we would have coffee but i we'll figure that aspect out later <laughs> you'll bring but in yeah, the coffee we'll bring it in but like set. um i but i can like totally picture the decorative skills and and ideas like this year it's going to be way better than just like my horse with the stupid stocking yeah my house or my my house my barn is going to be like the shit <laughs> I just love it. But do you get anxiety about Christmas? Because yeah, totally. I absolutely do. So my whole thing is that like every year I'm always like, Christmas is coming. I don't – I'm always like, I'm not going to work that much this year. I'm going to do all the Christmas things. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get really into like the season and then I – don't because I end up working and um, I don't do all the Christmas things that I want to do. And then the closer we get to the actual day of Christmas, I get like more and more depressed because right. all I can think about is how it's going to be over. So then on Christmas Day, I'm usually like kind of downcast because it's going to be over at the end of the well, day. This and year- it bums me out. So all the lead up to the d- – and then the day – that is the day that's supposed to be the happiest day that all of this has been leading up to. I'm like <laughs> bummed out because all I can think about is how it's going to be over. I have an issue with living in the now. It's really bad. I Well, this year I feel like I'm more stressed out than normal because I decided a few months ago that I was going to finish um, – my schooling for nursing. Mm-hmm. So I decided I was going to go back. Um, and so I had to like challenge the test and in order to like apply my old credits and yada, yada, yada. Well, I found out that my school starts December 17th. And I'm like, that like puts a damper in the middle Day of like Christmas. Yes. And I have two feature dance gigs like the weekend before and the weekend of. Mm-hmm. And I'm an idiot and agreed to take like a feature dancing gig. Like I think it's like the 21st to the 23rd. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, it's like prime Christmas season. Yes. I mean, that's right before Christmas season. So n- this year I feel like I have a lot of extra pent up anxiety just mm-hmm. because I'm nervous going back to school mm-hmm. and then nervous about like Christmas and just in general I'm just like a nervous person <laughs> dude I I'm like I'm I don't know what the word is but like I'm a hypochondriac when it comes to like nerves I don't uh, not like sicknesses but just mm-hmm. like I'm always nervous like I'm scared when I walk into a room I'm like okay what's going to happen <laughs> yeah you know yeah and um I think that a lot of it just has to do with like past things. Right. And I'm a very misunderstood person and mm-hmm. I feel like I'm in a either I'm not like one of those people where like everyone loves me, mm-hmm. but I'm not one of those people where everyone hates me. Yeah. I'm either you really like me, it's like split in the middle. Either you really like me or you really don't. Mm. And I have a problem with really fixating on people and why they don't like me. It's hard. Because I just hard. want people to like me. Yeah, yeah. And so you're, you're like, it. wait a minute, but I was always nice to that person. Like, yeah. why don't they like me? Oh, yeah. Especially if you don't know them and you're like, what the fuck? Why don't you like, be my friend? You know, <laughs> like, you're like, I just want you to love me. Like, why don't you like me? So I have a, I have a problem with that that I'm trying to like work on as I'm like approaching 30 years old. I'm like, okay. Lady, you just need to let it go. Like, not everyone's going to like you. And then, yeah. like, the other side of me is like, 
but I want them to like me. That's the hardest thing. You can't control other people's behavior or reaction to you. You can only control your reaction to their behavior. Yeah. And it, it's hard. It's hard to accept that people may not like you because you want to fix it and right. you want to, you know. I'm a total fixer. Yeah. And one thing that I do admire about myself is that I always acknowledge when I've fucked up. Yeah. I'm always like, hey, dude, I was a dick. Yeah. It may take a while or it may take myself like, you know, figuring out like, okay, wow, that was a shit move. Mm -hmm. So whenever I go out of my way to like really fix things Mm -hmm. and the other person doesn't want to fix it, which is totally okay – I have a hard time like accepting that. Yeah. Like I don't like unfinished business. Right. I don't like having enemies and I don't like having people. I'd rather you just be like, meh, whatever. Yeah. Then like dislike me. Yes. I know exactly how Do you, you have that? Like oh, I totally. It's, Are you kidding me? Like and and it's it's horrible when you see it like on social media. Mm-hmm. Like people just and I'm sure that you get it way worse than I do, where people just attack you kind of for no reason. I wish I had that ability to just fuck it, I don't care. Yeah. Fuck I think that. few people have that ability. I think most of us care a lot about what other people think of us. Yeah. You know, because it, it which is so stupid. Which is so stupid. And I think social media feeds that, you know, mm-hmm. because you look for validation through strangers, through people that you don't know and so weird, right? Yeah. And it's just like it, these people don't actually know you. They've never met you in real life, but they've formed this opinion of you. But and your feelings get hurt, and you're and like, your and they and probably like live, like I said, in their parents' basement, and you're like crying over you. Yeah, they said, it. Hey. well, and then too, like when you when you allow that to affect you, then you've given them the power that they're seeking, right? To um, have some kind of effect on somebody, because a lot of them, I think, feel like they have no control over their own lives, so they try to go out and like spread their tentacles into other people's lives and make yeah. them feel bad and then it makes them feel like uh, may, I feel like sometimes it just makes them feel like someone actually listened to them you know like no one listens to them right and I think it's a way saying to mean just to, saying mean to you and you responding they're like oh an attention grab me. yeah attention grab and I was able to like affect somebody because mm-hmm. they feel so ineffective in their own personal life I love to psychoanalyze oh, like, I'm Twitter so trolls weird. like you know what's awesome <laughs> but scary at the same time is mm-hmm. like As a person, I find from the age of 27, when I turned 27, something like clicked in my head. Mm -hmm. And from 27 to 29, I've been on like the spiritual journey, but not like one of those like weirdo spiritual journeys where I'm like constantly on like social media, like pray to all, be positive. No, like my own personal. (laughs) gratitude. Yeah, like my own personal (laughs) spiritual journey of like how can I make myself the mm-hmm. best version of myself for other people. Right. You know, not yeah. just for myself. So that included like reaching out to people that I might have been a dickhead to mm-hmm. or making amends with people that even though you don't necessarily, uh, you know, want to reconnect, but in order to better yourself as a person, you have to forgive those people and and give them another chance. And by giving them another chance, I don't mean like, hey, they shit on you and you know, not holding that grudge, yes. being just very like, hey, I don't have any negative feelings towards you. So letting go was something that I, I have worked on really hard for the last few years. Yeah. And it's a work in progress, but I think that learning to let go is the best tool you can ever... It's the greatest gift you can give yourself. Yes. Forgiveness. Yes. And I don't know if it's come with maturity or... I think that's a big part of it. Or life experience, but... I think those things go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Um, I I mean, you know, I'm in a 12-step program, so I have to actively work that kind of stuff in order to basically stay sober and... Like not become a complete fuck up. So, yeah, people um, often ask me, like, "Am I like recovering, or mm-hmm. am I working like the twelve step program, or is this like the part where you apologize?" And I'm like, "No, nine. N- no, I'm I'm just 
I'm just doing it because I feel like it's the right thing to do. I mean, honestly, I've always said I think the 12-step program can help anybody with everything because you can apply it to anything. You gave really me that book, remember? Which one was it? The Power uh, – wait. Power the four, the, No, The Four Agreements or The the Five Agreements or The, the Four Agreements. The Four Agreements. Did I? Yeah, you gave me that book. I don't know if I've read it. Did I read it? Yes. Fuck. <laughs> I when I gave it to you. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm just saying, you gave me that book when I was like cuckoo and I had, you know what's awesome though? It's like, um, so I had like everyone, it's kind of common knowledge that mm-hmm. I had like a mental breakdown, mm-hmm. which is pretty gnarly because people didn't think I was going to come back, but I actually came back a better version of myself. Mm-hmm. So I feel like so everyone has like their version of rock bottom. Like if you're an addict, hitting rock bottom. Yeah. If you know you've been through really hard times, hitting rock bottom. And so like I feel like my nervous breakdown was the best thing that ever happened to me yeah. because I don't know. I just feel like I'm a I'm a much more uh, forgiving, loving selfless person than I was. I think it's really great to go through that because it really changes your perspective. It it pops that bubble that we live in, you know? Like I'm so humble now and I am so thankful. Like every day I'm like, wow, I have a really nice house and a nice car Mm -hmm. and uh, nice pets and nice things. Mm -hmm. Whereas Back in the day, I always wanted more, 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 more. Yeah. It, like, there was never anything, it, like, it never was enough. Yes. I know exactly what you mean. It's like, um, it's like trying to constantly fill that void and it just, nothing ever works. You can pile money and, you know, new furniture and house and boys and sex and booze and drugs and mm-hmm. it'll just, like, it'll just, it'll, you'll never be able to fill it. And it's, it's so much like something that you have to work on on the inside. Yeah. I have um, a friend that I text a gratitude list to every night. She texts me one and I text her. Oh, cool. And that, that helps. I was actually talking to a friend of mine who said that, who um, read something or watched some kind of interview with like a, a psychologist. And he talked about how this like 21 day program where every single day, I don't know if it's if you write it down or you exchange it with somebody else, tell somebody else three things you're grateful for, three new things every single day for 21 days straight, how it will literally change your brain chemistry and it'll shift your perspective. Right. And I think that that's totally true. I went through a really, really hard time this year. Like this year was one of the hardest years for me. It just started off just awful. It just had all these things happen to me at once and I spiraled off into this horrible depression and... You know, my drinking uh, spun out of control again. And um, and I really just focused on trying to be grateful for what I had and, like, doing meditations mm-hmm. and doing writing and, like, saying my gratitude list, even though I didn't feel it. Right. And, and trying to manifest, like, this this faith that like I was going to be okay. You have to be so careful not to become a victim of yourself. Yes, exactly. And that's so easy, especially like... So easy to play the victim. It's cop out. It totally is. Yeah. And especially like with me, um, you know, through therapy and stuff, like with with my bipolar disorder, Mm -hmm. I... I became bipolar because that was part of my breaking point with my nervous breakdown. Right. After I came out from my nervous breakdown, they were like, oh, hey, you're bipolar. So I had to learn how to live with this. And I would lash out and have like, I would say the most terrible things to people, mm-hmm. horrible things. I would do horrible things. And I'd be like, oh, it's because I'm bipolar. Yeah. And then through therapy, I learned, no, you can't be a victim of yourself. Just because you have a disorder or you have an addiction right. or whatever, you have to still take responsibility. Exactly. Even yeah. though it just is going to be harder for you. Like me, my biggest problem is I have a venom venomous mouth when I get angry. Yeah. Or when somebody pushes my buttons, when mm-hmm. somebody pokes a bear, I say the most horrible things. Mm-hmm. And then I used to be like, oh, it's because I'm bipolar. But now it's like, no, it was because I was being an asshole and because I am bipolar, that that was, you know, one of the fiery underlinings of it all. But right. if I if if I accept that, that was my own behavior. Yeah. Yeah. You have to take yeah, I mean, like what they say, you know, for example, they say for me, like it's not your fault you're an alcoholic, but it's your responsibility to do something right. about it. Because, I mean, 
you can't be like a raging alcoholic and then just be like, oh, well, that's how I was born with. I'm just going to sit here and be a victim of my own circumstance. Mm -hmm. Like, you sure, you can do that and you can spend the rest of your life fucking miserable and nobody wants to have anything to do with you. Right. But I mean, you dug that hole for yourself. Like, you know, as human beings, it's our responsibility. We all have our own demons. Everybody Mm -hmm. does. No one's perfect. And it's your responsibility and it's your life's challenge to face that and to conquer that. I mean, people right. are always like, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? I think that that's probably it. Now, do you find yourself like extra sensitive to when people make jokes about like addicts, like stereotypical jokes? Like, because with me, I've, this is something that I'm working on right now is yeah. like people make stereotypical jokes about like bipolar disorders. Mm-hmm. Like Kanye West is a big one. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are like, yeah, it's because he's crazy bipolar, he's off his meds. And it's like, I have empathy for somebody like that because the thing about bipolar disorder that a lot of people don't understand and they wonder like, oh, why why don't they just keep taking their meds and they won't be Mm -hmm. crazy? The crazy chemistry behind being bipolar that I took trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, error. Is that when you take your medication, you start feeling better. Mm -hmm. You you don't want to take it anymore. And then you're like, I don't need to take it. I'm fine. Fuck you. And then when you get off your medication, you go into this whole like, depending on what type of bipolar you are, Mm -hmm. bipolar one or two or whatever. And then you go into this spiraling mode of I'm normal. This is normal. I feel normal. And then people around you start, you know, thinking, Whatever. But my but my point is, is that does it bother you when people have stereotypes with like addicts or did it used to? Because with me, it really bothers me and it hurts my feelings. And I'm like, oh, well, they don't know my history. But when people are like, oh, Kanye West is crazy again off his meds and it like hurts my feelings. Yeah. I mean, I'm super sensitive, though. So it is frustrating sometimes when what frustrates me is is. When people sometimes say something like, well, you know, alcoholism isn't a disease and, you know, you're just weak. It's a willpower thing. And why don't you just stop? Because, but it's like, I think it's probably the same as you trying to explain to me, like, what bipolar is, like, me trying to explain to you, like, what alcoholism is. It's just one of those weird fucking things I can't explain to you. Like, I remember, you know, my boyfriend asking me, you know, during like my last episode, I mean, poor guy's been, I put him through so much. Um, he's just like, I don't understand why you do this to yourself. He's like, you have a family who loves you. I love you. You have a successful career. You have fans who love you. You have friends who love you. Like everything's great in your life. Why do you do this to yourself? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. And that just makes me feel worse right? For to be questioned like that. Because I don't you think I think that to myself mm-hmm. every single day. Don't you think that like when I'm fucking sneaking little balls of vodka in my purse and I'm like <laughs> hiding it in my car. like the airplane drive, bottles? Yeah, airplane bottles. Those <laughs> things like trigger me. When I see those around, I'm like that, that always gets me. Right. Like if I see those in movies or whatever, like because that was such a mm-hmm. fixture of my life. Um, I mean, don't you think that I ask myself that question every fucking day? Like when I was, you know, it's like my hands won't listen to my brain. Right. Um, but in a strange way, I'm almost, I mean, now that I'm on the other side of it and I'm sober, I, there's a strange part of me that's grateful for it because it forced me to look at myself in a way that I don't think I ever would have done before. Right. And a lot of people aren't forced to look at themselves in the way that I did because they don't have this insane fucking disease which would very likely mm-hmm. kill you and destroy your life. Yeah. Like it's like a matter of life and death for me. Like I have to live my life a certain way otherwise I will destroy myself. It's bizarre but in a strange way it's sort of like a gift. Right. Because like I'm very conscious of all of that and I don't know. I wouldn't trade the journey for anything. It's made me who I am and it's made me very grateful totally. for what I have. And I feel like you probably feel the same way about what you went through. Yeah. And, you know, I, uh, I, it's definitely made me more of an empathetic person. Yeah. Because I used to really struggle with like judgment. Not judgment. I was never a judgmental person, but a very. I lacked empathy. Mm-hmm. I like if somebody was in an abusive relationship, I'd be like, "Well, then just fucking leave." Yeah. But considering like what I went through and my past, and and being a survivor um, of a domestic violence relationship, I have such a total different 
outlook. Um, you know, when people when people would commit suicide or would hurt themselves or had, you know, issues, depression issues, I would be like, eh, just get over it. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, whoa, that's not how it works. Yeah. When so, you're in that state, it's like it's so hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And I've I feel like there. I feel like um, you know, especially with this industry ever evolving and mm-hmm. changing, um sometimes I become a victim of, you know, my own emotions because I'm like, oh, why can't the industry be like this anymore? Yeah. And I and I oh, there's nothing more that I love to do is sit around and bitch about how it used to be. <laughs> I used to and how it's not like that at all anymore. I wish I was the good a old days, girl. Yeah. <laughs> I get paid like you know this much to like yeah. shoot once a month. Yeah, like work once a month. Yep. But now the hustle's different. The hustle's I mean, now so you different. really have to hustle. Yeah. And the competition is fierce. Yeah. And um, I think like the hardest part for me is just trying my hardest not to be like that jaded person. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. Because sometimes there's there's a lot of like comfort in falling into that whole like fuck my life now and oh it used to be so much better and poor right. me and nobody pays for their porn anymore and it's everybody else's well, fault. Well, now there's not really – there isn't really any stars. Like mm-hmm. there's the it girl for that – flavor of the month yeah. or six months or whatever, and then they, like, disappear yeah. because they do everything in one sitting. Yeah. And um, there's no buildup to it, whereas, I mean, I took 10 years to do an anal scene. Yeah. Like, whoa. Yeah. And I took, what, five years to do a boy-girl scene, and then I took off a couple of years, and then I came back and started doing boy-girl. Like, it's so different. Yeah. What would you give <clears throat> um so my like my, my last question for you is what would you do differently knowing what you know now mm-hmm. what would you do differently when you first got in the industry and is there any way to tie that into advice that you would give to new girls What I would have done differently I think is what I would have done if I knew how the industry is now or <laughs> yeah, I know, right? What would you have done differently if you could see the future? Yeah, I know, right? <clears throat> um, well, I think that I would have definitely not. Um, God, this is a hard question. It, what I would have done differently is I definitely would have done boy girl a lot sooner. Mm-hmm. I would have done it. When the contract girl still existed, mm-hmm. I started you could have doing. Gotten a lot of money for your first boy girl. Yeah, I mean yeah. Jules Jordan. I'll never forget. Used to like beg me to do yeah. boy, my first boy girl and offer me a lot of money, and I just was like me 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 no no no. But the advice that I would give to girls is that don't let these agents or directors or producers tell you that you have to do everything all at once. Take it slow because what you're seeking is longevity. Mm -hmm. Longevity is so hard to achieve in this industry, and I think that everyone who's taken their time, yeah, you're not going to be like the it girl right away. You're not going to be that girl, but it's okay. Who cares? The it girl is not making what you're making. I can tell you I make more money than the it girls make because I'm not doing $800 $800 boy girl scenes for a box cover. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not having sex 12 times a week, mm-hmm. hustling, killing my body, and burning myself out. So I keep my rate high, and you just have to stay grounded. Don't mm-hmm. don't let these people chip at you because they don't care about you. Right. The only person that's going to care about you is yourself. Yeah. So, so it's self-respect. 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 Respect. Thank you so much for coming Thanks on. Thanks for having me. It was so good to see you. I feel like we had a very, like, it was interesting. I feel like most of our conversation was not about porn at all. No. Which I like. Yeah. See, people, she's a real person. I'm a real person. She's a real person with thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams. And a heart. And excellent holiday decorating skills. Very. <laughs> Maybe that's something that you should go into. You I can know. start doing, like, the Macy's like, windows. I should, do, like, a professional, like, decorator. Dude, if I had the money, I'd have you come over and do it for me. Oh, man. Yeah. One day. I get (laughs) (laughs) cray-cray. Tell everyone where they can find you on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. 
I'm Brett Rossi, the letter I, the letter M, B-R-E-T-T-R-O-S-S-I, or brettrossi.com because it has like all that stuff. So perfect. Yeah. And you can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and Twitter and go to my Patreon if you want to support this podcast, patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. See you guys next week. Mm-hmm.